Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining Sustainable Solutions Group for our webinar on Dr. Temple Grandin's Tripod Approach to Humane Slaughter. I would like to let you know that we're going to have some time at the end of the presentation for asking questions. So please feel free to enter your questions as we go in the question and answer field on the webinar screen. And now I would like to present our speakers for today. We have Janice Neisel. Janice is principal and founder of Sustainable Solutions Group, and she has guided top food industry decision makers at multi-billion dollar grocers, food service, and restaurant chains in responsible sourcing improvements and messaging for meat, dairy, and eggs with World famous Dr. Temple Grandin as an advisor, Sustainable Solutions Group has created a structured, data driven, responsible sourcing roadmap approach to more nutritious and humane sourcing of animal proteins. Good morning, Janice. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being in attendance with us. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Wendy Fullwider. She studied under Dr. Temple Grandin to earn her PhD and works with producers providing third-party audits to evaluate their handling and housing practices and improve animal well-being. Dr. Fullwider was farm animal care specialist for Organic Valley, the nation's largest organic farmer cooperative, as well as the Global Animal Partnership five-step rating program used by Fortune 500 retailers and restaurant chains. Hello, Dr. Fullwider. Good morning. And then finally, we have Dr. Juliana Miguel, who is a Peruvian veterinarian who holds an MSc in Applied Animal Behavior and Welfare from the University of Edinburgh and a PhD in Dairy Cattle Applied Behavior and Welfare from the University of Nottingham. Her training and research focused in dairy and beef cattle behavior and welfare. Currently, Dr. Miguel is working as a farm animal welfare consultant for an international and local NGO in Mexico and Latin America, and is a farm animal welfare lecturer at the local university. Dr. Miguel has several published papers in recognized academic journals in the areas of animal welfare and production. Hello, Dr. Miguel. Hi, good morning to everybody. Mm -hmm. So those are our panelists today for this webinar. And Janice, would you like to begin? Sure. I'm going to go ahead and open up the presentation. Uh, Sarah, I think you need to make me host. Can you make me the host? Oh, okay. Hmm. It's not giving me that option, actually. Or um, Juliana, can you make me the host? Okay, I just... I just made Juliana the host. Juliana, uh, could you share your slides, please? Yes. We apologize for this delay. We should have our presentation up momentarily. Fantastic. Thank you. So I am Janice Neitzel. Uh, founder and CEO of Sustainable Solutions Group. And here is our dial-in information if you are having a problem getting the uh, information, uh, hearing it on your computer. Next slide. Here is our team that Sarah just introduced. So, Dr. Temple Grandin is our advisor, and we're going to prevent the present the information to you today on Dr. Temple Grandin's tripod approach to ensuring humane slaughter in your supply chain. Next slide. Oh, 
companies come to us because demand for higher welfare, healthier food is greater than its supply right now and companies need a plan. Consumers and animal groups are demanding transparency in sourcing and companies are seeking guidance from us. Next slide. Here's what we're going to cover today. We're going to be looking at some whistleblowing meat inspectors. This happened back in 2013. We're going to cover primarily what is your risk. We're providing information to you so you can understand what's happening in some plants and on some farms. We'll also talk about the slowly changing landscape and Dr. Temple Grandin's tripod approach. Next slide. In 2013, in the Kansas City Star, there came out a big article in Meat Country where meat inspectors said to the Kansas City Star that a U.S. federal audit found meat inspectors unevenly enforced humane slaughter rules or don't enforce them at all. And unfortunately, it was because their bosses won't support them. Dr. Temple Grandin says that inconsistent enforcement and vague regulations means some plants get away with really mistreating animals and doing bad stuff while others abide by the law. So we are looking at this today to give you some information on what you need to be concerned about to minimize your risk. Next slide. The requirements for humane slaughter are that animals must be protected from avoidable excitement, pain, or suffering and in this way, the animal must be effectively restrained, stunned, rendering the animal insensible to pain, and bred, rap, bled rapidly and profusely to ensure death before recovery could occur. Dr. Temple Grandin says that plants that have good handling and stunning practices have a top manager who cares about animal welfare. In 2013, this U.S. federal audit found that there is uneven enforcement of humane handling rules at plants, that enforcement policies do not deter repeat violators, that there's insufficient post-mortem and sanitation inspections in some cases, and that the swine pilot program where it, line speeds were increased. So HIMP is a program where line slaughter speeds are increased to go faster and that the pilot program was lacking sufficient oversight. Conscious pigs were being shackled and hoisted and unhealthy pigs were being slaughtered. So this was found in this 2013 US federal audit. Next slide. So what's your risk? Let's take a look at that. We have consumer concerns. In the US, nearly 60% are concerned about food animal treatment how they're raised, housed, fed, slaughtered, and antibiotic use. In 2016, it was found that 71% of people associate the humanely raised claim with meaning the animals humanely slaughtered. We have some information on Latin American consumers. Nearly 50% of Latin American consumers are, considered, are, are concerned about slaughter methods, and particularly the 18 to 29-year-olds. Nearly 90% associate a good animal welfare production system, meaning that that will provide higher quality products. We all know that there's viral videos that come out on social media. Just for example, in 2015, all of these different animal groups produced a viral video going into a poultry plant. So Mercy for Animals, Animal Legal Defense Fund, Compassion Over Killing, Humane Society of the United States. It's no longer one or two groups. There are many animal activist groups going into poultry and livestock plants and videotaping, and in some cases, attaching a brand name of a food company to the video where there are animal cruelty or poor conditions at slaughter. 
It's not just in the United States. Here are images from a state-owned slaughterhouse in Mexico. Pigs, sheep, cattle. These are the species that are covered under the U.S. Humane Slaughter Act but there are still bad conditions happening because of uneven enforcement. There are investment community concerns. In recent years, there is now a report, the Business Benchmark for Farm Animal Welfare. This is for investors, and it's describing how global companies are managing and reporting on farm animal welfare. In the 2016 report, that was the fifth version they covered 99 food companies worldwide. It says farm animal welfare continues to be a systemic risk that many companies in the food industry are either not effectively managing or not properly reporting. So we're providing this information to you this morning so you can understand your risk and how to minimize that risk. Citigroup said as early as 2008, concerns over animal cruelty can present headline risks to food companies. In 2014, another finance group said, in the case of animal welfare, failure to keep pace with changing consumer expectations and market opportunities could, could pump, put companies and their investors at a competitive disadvantage. And then Calvert, in 2015, asked a major U.S meat producer to disclose the risks associated with using pig breeding crates, a specific issue. So let's look at current conditions. In 2017, is U.S. Humane Slaughter Act being enforced? And I just want to point out that in Europe, there is also regulations on slaughter. In U.S., there is the Humane Slaughter Act. In Latin America, there aren't as many regulations, so these things do apply worldwide because many food companies do operate worldwide. So we're going to look at some cases of USDA data in particular. In 2017, a report on cattle, pigs, and sheep compiled actual USDA data. These species, mammals, are covered under the U.S. Humane Slaughter Act. And this report compiled slaughter plant violations that are happening with actual USDA data. We're also going to look at information from a 2016 report on poultry. Poultry, even though poultry, uh, turkeys, chickens are 99% of the animals killed for food in the world because they are much smaller than cattle and sheep and pigs. They are not covered under the U.S. Humane Slaughter Act. So that should both say the Humane Slaughter Methods Act. We just shortened it there. And so we're going to look at what happened in these cases. So these reports found some common federal plant violations at the slaughter plants. Now, the good news is that, well, I'll show you. So on the left, we've got the 2007 to 2009 data, and on the right is 2010 to 2015. And the good news is that conscious animals being shackled, hoisted, or cut decreased in recent years. So you can see that that is in the light blue, and that decreased quite a bit. It still needs to go down to zero, but that was a good improvement. In the light green, you can see that also decreased, and that covers disabled animals being handled better in recent years. So the light blue and the light green, those were improvements that were found in the data in recent years. However, if you look at the darker green, ineffective stunning tripled in recent years, and in peach, that's about the same. The distances to slaughter are too far, or animals are not slaughtered in a timely manner, causing failure to provide water or feed to still be a major problem. In the dark blue, unfortunately, those are the same. And from uh, the earlier years to more recent years, 
that shows that improper handling and use of excessive force on the livestock and poultry at the slaughter plants is still a problem. In orange, you can see that that's almost the same amount. That shows broken down pens or equipment is still a problem. And so this was found at USDA slaughter plants in using USDA data. So for the cattle, pigs, and sheep, humane slaughter is about proper stunning of the animal so that it is not conscious and does not feel pain at slaughter. The most frequent causes found of this not happening are lack of work, work training, use of inappropriate stunning devices, improper shot placement, sometimes with an adequate restraint, stunning equipment not routinely tested or maintained, and no functional backup stunning devices. And if you remember from our prior slide, these are very much what humane slaughter is about, restraining the animal properly, stunning effectively on the first shot. Poultry, as we mentioned, are not included in the U U.S. Humane Slaughter Act. So that's why animal advocacy groups in particular have been concerned about poultry slaughter because it's so many of the animals killed for food and they're not covered in, a, in our U.S. regulation. So these are some of the problems that can go wrong in poultry slaughter. First, the bird may not be secured properly and the legs can be broken during that. Next, the bird may attempt to right itself while it's hung upside down, and its head is supposed to be going through the electrified water bath. That is the stunning step in poultry. But if the bird lifts its head, it misses that electrified water, and it is not stunned. So then it goes to the blade. If it lifts its head and misses the automated blade, there's a backup cutter. If the line is going so fast, the plant worker who is the backup cutter may also miss cutting its neck. So any of these things can happen. If the bird misses all three of those, then the live bird goes into the uh, scalding water tank. The scalding water is to remove the feathers, so the bird is supposed to be dead at that point. If it goes into the scalding water tank live, it becomes bright red from, and it's blood saturated and the bird carcass is discarded. The USDA does record how many of these happen. Next slide. So in the report, based on 1,000 plus violations that were documented at US poultry plants, the most common violations found are the following. Now, this is not to say that this happens this percentage of the time. This says in the documents that were studied, Birds drowning in a scalding tank were mentioned in 32% of the USDA documents. Inadequate shackling, studying, or cutting was mentioned in 14% of the USDA documents studied. Improper sorting of birds. When the birds arrive, they're sorted. The ones that are dead already go into one pile, and the ones that are alive go into being slaughtered. And that sorting was done improperly, mentioned in 22%. So that means live birds are ending up in the dead bird pile. Excessive dead on arrival or inhumane holding conditions ended up being documented in 5% of the USDA document study. So let's talk about US Humane Slaughter Act enforcement. Animal welfare enforcement is low compared with food safety enforcement. Food safety enforcement is being handled very well. Enforcement varies dramatically by state, so this is a state-by-state -state issue, and repeat violators are a major problem. It's interesting to note that humane handling inspection, which is the animal welfare piece at the slaughter plant, is funded at only 2.5% of the total food safety inspection funding. So this could be a risk for you. In 2013, the Animal Welfare Institute has asked the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Services, the FSIS, 
to require slaughter plants to have comprehensive written animal handling plans, to have animal handling and humane slaughter training for their workers, and to have routine testing and maintenance of stunning equipment. This has not been addressed, and this was requested in 2013 and years after that. Comprehensive animal handling, handling plans are in only 35% of federally inspected plants. So even though there is a law, a Humane Slaughter Act law in the US, it is not being enforced consistently. It varies state by state. Poultry is a different case because it's not covered. And plants do not necessarily have animal handling plans and training in place or routine testing and maintenance of stunning equipment. These are large risks to food companies. Dr. Fulwider, do you want to go ahead and continue? Yes, uh, the USDA is increasing slaughter line speeds. Next slide. The pilot program is directed at pigs. The goals of this HIMP or HACCP inspection models project is to produce flexible, more efficient, and fully integrated meat and poultry inspection systems. The second part is aimed at processing more animals per day. The swine hemp program may pose a risk to human as well as animal safety. According to the 2013 OIG audit report, the swine hemp program has shown no measurable improvement to the inspection process. USDA HIMP program um, also is referred to as the modernization of poultry slaughter inspection and it has been in introduced to approximately 15 plants. It was expected to move from the current 140 birds processed per minute to 175. Here's a list of reports on worker risks. You can see there are reports here from 2010, 2013, and 2016. What does all of this mean? It means that it is more dangerous for workers when line speeds increase, pushing workers to rush and do more animals per minute increases injuries to workers. Birds are also at risk. The faster the line is moving, the more likely it is for increasing numbers of birds to be dropped on the floor and birds to not be shackled correctly. The optimum speed will balance profit and safety for the handling of the birds. Next slide, please. Some of our U.S. representatives approve of these line speed increases, while 60 Congress people have urged the delay of the HIMP program, stating that while we strongly support modernizing our food safety system and making it more efficient, modernization should not occur at the expense of public health, worker safety, or animal welfare. Next slide, please. At least 40 different groups from many sectors, including public health, consumer protection, labor, employer and civil rights, are all opposed to any increase in line speeds, stating that increasing line speeds would be reckless and dangerous. The best way to guarantee safe food is to have our workers be safe. 
Next slide. Kosher slaughter risks. Next slide. According to Dr. Grandin, the shackling and hoisting in kosher slaughter is a violation of all industry and international welfare guidelines. We chose not to share photos of shackling and hoisting, but instead the humane restraint device that keeps the animals comfortable and in the upright position. The restraint is recommended or approved by Dr. Grandin. Israel has banned the shackle and hoist method for imports effective June 1st, 2018. 80% of the kosher beef that is sourced by Israel from South America where shackle and hoist is commonly used. A shackle and hoist method is not allowed in the United States but imports are allowed via a loophole that bypasses animal welfare. The halal and kosher slaughterhouses have been exempt from USDA oversight since 1958 via the Humane Slaughter Act. Plant management basically gets down to the attitude of the particular manager to determine how each plant operates, including whether or not employees, whether or not it employs pre-slaughter stunning. According to Dr. Grandin, eliminating shackling and hoisting of conscious live cattle improves both animal welfare and personal safety for the rabbi. Dr. Grandin also suggests that closed circuit televisions ensure that operations are safe, legal, and humane. Thanks, Dr. Wendy, I'm going to talk now to, to you about AFMA mass calling methods. For those who don't know, AFMA stands for American Veterinary Medical Association. AFMA mass calling methods are a social media risk. Why do we need mass calling methods? Well, we need humane methods for disease control purposes, for example, in a case of avian influenza outbreak. But AFMA current guidelines are water-based foam, drowning that causes drowning or suffocation of the birds, ventilation shutdown, death by heat, stress, and suffocation, and live burial. But AFMA, current, uh, sorry, no, no, none of these methods are allowed by the World Organization Animal Health, who is in charge of providing recommendations about animal health and welfare to all its 180 countries, country members. This is an area, also, the USDA says that VSD could be used as a last option for the population. This is an area where we need more research to make an informed recommendation. This is why this year, the North Carolina State University, funded by the USA Poultry and Egg Association, compared three methods of the population, ventilation shutdown, ventilation shutdown plus CO2, ventilation shutdown plus heat. The study found that the time of birth's death was up to 91 minutes in the VSD. Still, 4% of hens survive. The VSD plus heat took up to 54 minutes for the birds to die. And the VSD plus CO2 took up to 12 minutes. 
There are positive things in the horizon as the landscape is slowly changing. For example, the control atmosphere stunning for poultry and pigs. This is used widely in Europe and at some plants in the USA. PETA and the Humane Society consider this a humane method and are pushing, pushing for its introduction. But what are the benefits? It provides a lower stress environment for workers and animals. Animals are moving groups, eliminate the stress of moving pigs in a single line. Birds are moved in, in, within the crate. Live birds are not hanging. Uh, this is something important to remember because we need to consider that birds uh, don't have a diaphragm, the muscle that divides the chest and the abdomen. So when they are hanging upside down, the birds guts put pressure over the lungs and heart, making the birds uncomfortable and possibly causing them pain. Also, the noise levels are reduced by 20%. Because the birds are not handled uh, when they are conscious, there is less flapping and less chances for the staff to bruise the animals. So there is evidence of increased meat yield, improved meat quality, and decreased contamination. Another good news is that CCTV cameras are now required at, required at all the slaughterhouses in England. This must be put in all areas where live animals are kept. And the official veterinarians must have an restricted 24 seven access to the footage. The British Veterinary Association and the Veterinary Public Health Association carried out survey among its members. And they said that 64 of UK veterinarians believe welfare at the slaughter is a top priority. Nine in 10 vets believe consumers should be better informed about the slaughter methods. The president of the British Veterinary Association, Gundrun Rabbit, said that they recognize that the cost of installing CCTV may be a burden for some very small abattoirs, but it is important that the animals we farm for food have both a good life and humane death and CCTV has a key role to play in ensuring these requirements are met. So let's take a look at what we've covered. We've talked about the risk in your supply chain if animals are not insured to be slaughtered humanely. And basically, the biggest risk is with the social media videos. And we, as we all know, there's more and more of those. So between the uneven enforcement of the U.S. Humane Slaughter Act, with the USDA increasing line speeds to go faster, putting workers and livestock and poultry at risk, with kosher slaughter loopholes and using the old shackle and hoist, I say old, but it's really the current method for kosher slaughter, and with the American veterinarian mass culling methods. If these are shown on social media videos and your food company name is attached to it, it is a risk to you. So we wanna make sure that we explain to you Dr. Temple Grandin's tripod approach to ensuring humane slaughter in your, in your supply chain. So this is Dr. Grandin's approach. Dr. Grandin is an advisor to Sustainable Solutions Group, and it is written in her books and on her website. Next slide. When plants or farms are audited, they typically know they're going to be audited, so that could be the best day. It may not be a typical day. In really good plants or farms, it will be the same. But if it is scheduled and they know it's happening, the lines could be slowed down and less animals could be slaughtered that day. So 
know that if you get third-party audits, if you get that information, that is likely to be a better day. Dr. Grannon's tripod approach is that plants and farms should be doing their own internal audits daily or weekly using the regular audit forms that they will be third-party audited on. So that is their responsibility to be doing that. The second part of the tripod is that third-party audits by an independent auditing firm should be happening once or twice a year on any of the farms or plants that are providing to you. Now, there are some programs where plants or farms have really great passing scores on audits. It is not required every year. It might be required every few years. But generally, a third-party audit should be done with passing scores by an independent auditing firm once or twice a year. And then the third piece is that audits should be done by the corporate office of the customer. So Dr. Temple Grandin went with McDonald's Corporation in uh, the 1990s and their meat supplying company to the different plants. And she tells the story about how the numbers were, in, were very low for stunning on the first shot. And after they went in there, and had measurable audit forms, and they knew they were going to be third-party audited on a regular basis, the numbers dramatically went up into the 90%. So this is with the corporate food companies saying, we need to make sure we are ensuring humane slaughter for the animal proteins in our supply chain. So you want to do this by or with a trusted inspection partner, you want to do a percentage of your suppliers annually and on short notice, eventually unannounced. So this is the piece, number three, that is not really happening. And Dr. Grandin believes that if this third piece were happening, there would be more even enforcement of the Humane Slaughter Act. Next slide. So some information, each plant or farm is regarded as a separate unit. Clear and consistent guidelines need to be implied by the inspector. Dr. Temple Grandin writes her audit, uh, audit uh, reports, methods, uh, writes the audit methods so that any trained inspector can go in and there would be a similar outcome measurement by similarly entrained inspectors and our firm also uses that approach. You want to make sure that major and minor non-compliances are noted and that you communicate the corrective actions, that you find out from your suppliers what are happening. There should be a new inspection or audit after a period of time. And then for serious violations, consider what are the consequences. For example, some food companies stop buying for, from a plant for a minimum of 30 days if there are critical control points that are failed in an audit. So these are things that you want to consider. Next slide. We help you implement this approach. Next slide. In number two, what we do is you are, uh, the, the plants and farms are doing third-party audits in many cases. So we help you ask for those audit forms and we analyze them to make sure that they are passed, that the critical control points are being uh, passed, and also to understand if there are any risks. For instance, in the um, audit methods, for each section there are points that can be lost and a plant can still pass. But what we find sometimes is that plants and farms may always not get the full amount of points in different sections. And so we help to point out what improvements can be made, even if there's passing scores, because it might be a risk to a food company if those things are not corrected in each category. When an audit is done, a sample of livestock or poultry are looked at, say 50 pigs or 100 or 500 birds, and what happens is though there are 200,000 birds being processed in that day. So those numbers, when you apply it, if there's 5% or 4% with broken wings in a sample of 100 or 500, 
that then you can look at, well, how many have broken wings in the 200,000 that are slaughtered per day? So we are your trusted partner to understand what that means. You don't have to understand everything that that means, but we help you understand if there's any risks for you. Number three, then, is the new piece, can you go back, that Dr. Temple Grandin says is not happening nearly often enough. And this is audits where you require more audits of your plants. You have a trusted inspection partner, such as us or another audit firm, and you come with us or you, we work with you to provide to you the audit results for audits that are done on short notice. So what we would do is develop a plan. We would look at what your animal protein supply chain looks like, and we would help you decide based on budget how many audits can be done on an annual basis. Do you want to cover all of them within three years, within five years? What is the best approach? Is it geographically? Is it for species that are more at risk and to appear in social media videos? We help you figure out all that planning. And then we do the audits for you, or you can hire another auditing firm. But basically, we want to point out that this third leg of Dr. Temple Grandin's tripod approach is what's needed. It is the food companies holding audits through the corporate office, doing a number of suppliers annually on short notice and eventually unannounced. Next slide. Sustainable Solutions Group, we take a multi-year approach to implementation of animal welfare goals. So we help you with issue awareness. We help you understand your responsible sourcing vision and do an initial sourcing assessment. We understand the goals and strategies and help you set those. You take your actions, which are in a lot of cases communicating with your suppliers. And we work within your culture. Is your culture to ask questions of your suppliers? So we frame the risk to you and draft questions for you to ask your suppliers. If your uh, approach is different, we help you in whatever your culture is. We get the measurements for you, we help you put it into your CSR reporting and into your communications plan. Here's an overview of the services we offer. So we help you set policy. We help you with pre-crisis planning to make sure that you are understanding what is happening in your supply chain should a crisis happen. We help you with responsible strategic planning. We do our meat, dairy, and egg sourcing assessments, and we do group facilitation and executive coaching. Next slide. Our clients are at different levels. We work with some clients that are at the business as usual point, and we help them move to become a fast follower. We help companies that are fast followers to stay a fast follower if that's what you desire, or if you desire to become a leader or innovator and leapfrog, we can help you do that. We work at the leader uh, level, and we also work at the innovator level. Our specialty is in collaboration, understanding the issues, understanding your culture and working with you to approach this in the way that fits the way your company culture works. Next slide. Here's what a few companies we work with have had to say about us. Next slide. And I'd just like to finish with what Dr. Temple Grandin says, you manage what you measure. So we are talking about measuring animal welfare, enforcing the measurements and the consequences in a way of communication and ensuring that these things happen. So let's take a look, quick look at a few ways in corporate responsibility for things that are managed and measured. So corporate environmental data is measured. And you can see for this company, they've been doing it since 2005. So they're measuring it from year to year, 2005, 2006, 2007, and reporting on it. 
Now with animal welfare, you don't have to report on it if you're not comfortable, but we work with you behind the scenes to have the data and understand what's happening in your supply chain. So if you get asked questions, you can answer the questions. And then if you decide to become a leader or innovator and want to publish your data, you can also do that. That decision is yours. Next slide. Here's another example of a company that not only is environmental data measured, but social data is measured. They are measuring, I used to have a couple arrows on here, I guess they disappeared, but um, it talks about farmers, and it talks about, um, let's see, number four down, engage a total of 50,000 young people to innovate and take action in their communities by 2005. Um, and, oh, number two, improve farmers' access to carbon marker, markets. So you can see there's not only environmental data in here, there's social responsibility data being collected here, too. Next slide. And here is, here is some meat, plant, animal welfare data being measured. So in these corporate responsibility reports, you see it says animal welfare, showing the percentage of supplier processing plants audit and the percentage that received a passing score on their first or second audit. And it was tracked from 2006 to 2010, showing in this diagram. So here is showing animal welfare auditing being tracked. Next slide. Dr. Temple Grandin says measuring prevents bad from becoming normal. Next slide. Sarah, would you like to continue? Yeah, absolutely. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A area of your webinar screen. And I will begin taking questions. We've, we've actually gotten a fair amount of them. The first one, Dr. Fullwider, what is your experience in auditing? Dr. Fullwider, we can't hear you. Okay, is that better? Yes. Much better, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I have audited many farms and slaughter plants of all the different species over the course of three years with Dr. Grandin during my training. And since that time, I have audited hundreds of farms all across the country, uh, the United States, with, um, including dairy, beef, hogs, poultry, sheep and lambs, and I've also audited slaughter plants for the different species uh, since then as well with all, you know, beef and hogs and poultry and sheep and lambs. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Doc, um, this I think would be a good one for Dr. Miguel. Why should I care about the CAS system? Hi, yes, the, the CAS system, it's uh, at the moment is a better system in because we are not handling, we are not stressing the animals. Uh, we are moving all of them together uh, into the system. Uh, so Dr. the welfare Miguel. of the animals at that, sorry? Dr. Miguel, can you just explain what CAS stands for and what it's used sorry. for? Sorry, yeah, it's a control atmosphere uh, stunning method where we, exchange uh, the level of gases available in within that environment uh, usually is done uh, with co2 so we increase the levels of co2 while the levels of oxygen are decreased so the ideally the animals uh, will fall asleep before they uh, they reach unconsciousness or die uh, so this is a method that will stress less the animals but also the workers as i said previously the workers are not being uh, handling live animals so they uh, there will be less chances of them uh, bruising the animals or the flapping injuring the, the workers so i think it is a, a method to consider uh, when thinking about uh, what to do next in our uh, plants Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Miguel. 
Um, I think this question would be good for any of the panelists. How does video in slaughter plants improve animal welfare? Well, I could take that one if you like. Great. I think if, uh, if workers know that management cares and is concerned, their performance is going to be better. And if the cameras are installed, they know that someone is always watching. And we know from performance in other plants that that does help. Does anyone have anything else to add to that question? I think one of the, for example, in the UK, they, one of the recommendations the British Veterinary Association made was that uh, veterinarian officers could have access to this data as well for them to inspect what is going on when they are not there. Uh, so this is something also that is not only installing the cameras, it's also having access to, to the, the, uh, the information. Great, thank you, Dr. Miguel. Um, and this question I think would be good for any of the panelists as well. Why would the AVMA approved methods that, why would the AVMA approved methods that may not be humane? Well, I believe that that would happen in the event of an emergency or a disease outbreak when time is of the essence to uh, stop disease and prevent spread to the workers. It would also be a, a social media risk when consumers see mass culling on a video. Yeah, it, uh, I think uh, to add to that, so the, when there is, uh, avian influenza, avian, avian flu, or other things that happen, and a whole barn of animals needs to be killed rather than uh, to pre prevent the disease from passing to workers, to other animals, all of that. There are methods that are used. So the AVMA approves of them probably more for the effectiveness of stopping the spread of disease. And unfortunately, though, within the age of social media, if these things get in the video, and it is at a supplier that is related to a food company, it, it doesn't look good and it's not good for the animals. So there are more, uh, more research is needed and we support that and look forward to more humane methods being developed. Um, Sarah, can I interrupt just for a second? Um, mm -hmm. Erica, Vogue, Erica Vogue, who is, uh, hi Erica, is a friend of ours, just gave us an update that said that Dr. Patty Bennett reported at the uh, National American Meat Institute conference that 75% of slaughter plants now have a voluntary systematic approach to humane handling, according to USDA data. So that 35% that we had on there must be old, it's up to 75%. So that's good news and we're hoping that that continues to go up. Thanks, Erica. Excellent, thank you, Janice. Um, this question I think would also be fine for any of the panelists. What are the implications for the workers and livestock and poultry when increasing slaughter line speeds? Dr. Paul Weider, do you want to take that, increasing slaughter line speeds? Um, sure. Anytime slaughter line speeds are increased, there is greater uh, risk of injury to the workers as well as the livestock or poultry. Um, and if livestock or poultry are not stunned uh, effectively on the first shot, then they have to be stunned again. And that leads to more injury and more suffering and reduced meat quality and, and animals that might not be able to be processed for human consumption. Okay, great. Um... The next question I have um, for Dr. Fulwider, what are the implications when an animal is not stunned properly? Well, then of course that animal would have to be stunned again. And those animals are, you know, already injured and frightened at that point. And uh, that's something that might happen if you have someone that's new and they need more training, or it might be simply because the line is moving too fast and, and the workers are trying to hurry. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Fulwider. Um, and we'll end after this question. Um, Janice, can you explain how does your company help reduce risk of, of PR issues related to slaughter? So what we do is we take a proactive approach to understanding animal welfare in your supply chain. We do an initial meat, dairy, and egg sourcing assessment, asking questions of your suppliers. And we help you do that in a collaborative manner. Suppliers are getting these questions now on a regular basis. It's not as new as it was maybe years ago. And we help you understand the risks. So there are hot button issues that animal advocacy groups and consumers are looking at. And then we also understand what other issues are forthcoming and could appear in, uh, in videos and that kind of thing. We look at what your branding is about to understand that and do it at that level. So a lot of it is about establishing this partnership, understanding what you would like to see come out of it, and then we work at that level with you so that if you, unfortunately, would appear somehow in a bad way, in a negative way, we have all the information right at our fingertips, and we've helped food companies talk with animal advocacy groups to understand what's been uh, the work that's been done without sharing too much information, but minimizing your risk and getting your name removed from that association with the bad condition. And Sarah, just I think we had one more question here. Um, it says, you mentioned the time it takes for bird to, birds to die are up to an XX number of minutes. What were the average times, minimum times, and what was the distress levels for birds if documented of the different methods? Dr. Miguel, I don't know if you know this information offhand. Uh, I don't have it on the top of my mind, but we are more than happy to send you the, the information through an email. Uh, the, I think the most important thing here is that the minimum time is also important, but it's just how long it takes for the birds to die. So for how long they have been in this uh, stress and suffocation uh, or suffocated situation. Uh, but yeah, uh, we can send you the information later if that's okay. Yeah. So we have, um, my email address is on the last slide here that we're showing, Janice at SustSolutions.com. It says anonymous, we don't know who asked the question. So if whoever asked the question, if you want to send me an email, we can get that answered for you. And, and also, if we, um, Dr. Miguel, can you move the slide back to uh, back to that slide for chance because we do have the uh, reference there. So it was in the uh, the North Carolina study. Yes. Um. Okay, as Dr. Miguel does that, I would just like to thank, thank everyone for joining our webinar today on Dr. Temple Grandin's tripod approach with Janice Neitzel, Dr. Wendy Fulwider, and Dr. Juliana Miguel of Sustainable Solutions Group. Um, please contact Janice, like she said, at Janice, J-A-N-I-C-E, at sustsolutions.com if you have any questions or need help with anything. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you so much.